Hello, viewers, and welcome to yet another Warhammer 40,000 Conquest video production. My name is Mitch, and I am the Hive Tyrant. Today, Fantasy Flight Games unveiled one of the scarcely few preview articles we've seen thus far for our upcoming and first deluxe expansion, The Great Devourer. The name of this article is Out of the Ice, in which a host of brand new Tyranid cards were finally spoiled. So now we know not just one of the two warlords we've been promised within our upcoming box set, but also his entire signature squad, as well as several other Tyranid faction cards to boot. There are lots of spoilers to cover, and since we don't yet have all the information, Keep in mind that the vast majority of our upcoming Tyranid cards are still entirely unknown to us. I'll save the truly in-depth analysis and breakdown of each individual card for later videos. But I'll nevertheless give you my initial impressions now, and please share your own in the comments below. Still, in any case to catch up exactly where we left off in our last preview, we had previously had spoiled the unique Tyranid Warlord, Old One-Eye, with an attack value of 2, 6 hit points, 6 starting resources, and a starting hand size of 6. He has the Creature and Behemoth Hive Fleet traits, and Reaction. After this Warlord readies, remove half the damage from it, albeit limit once per round. So, definitely something to keep in mind with Old One-Eye is that although it seems like his starting hand size and starting pool of resources may be a little small relative to other, similar warlords we've seen, the Tyranid faction as a whole has access to Synapse units, and in the Great Devourer box set we're going to see a grand total of five, and at the beginning of any given game, the Tyranid player not only gets to start with their choice of Warlord on the tabletop, but they also get to pick any one specific Synapse unit as well. So you might effectively be trading a starting resource and card for something along the lines of a Savage Warrior Prime, the only Synapse unit we've had spoiled thus far, which it in and of itself is not just a 2-5 body on the table, but it gets commit to planets entirely separately from your Warlord, and its unique ability, which I presume all Synapse units will have some sort of effect, is that it's entirely able to trigger battles exactly like a Warlord can, and unless the opponent's Warlord happens to be present, during that battle you command Initiative, which for one of the big beefy units we're going to be spoiling later in this video is incredibly important to do. But, in taking a look at the rest of Old One-Eye's stats, he's certainly respectable, weighing in at an attack value of 2 that matches or surpasses so many other warlords, and although he certainly doesn't have the deepest pool of hit points, his ability nevertheless allows you, upon his readying, to remove half of his damage tokens. And in Conquest, considering that you're always rounding up, if it just so happens that he has 5 damage, tokens, you're ultimately going to be removing three. And once again, as we see in this spoiler-filled video, we do end up ultimately seeing an attachment that effectively boosts his printed hit points up to the same seven that we've seen on so many other warlords. So, the exact extent to the synergy and combos that are going to be possible with Old One-Eye are only going to become more and more illuminated in time, as we're likely to see more and more preview articles leading up to the inevitable, eventual release of the Great Devourer expansion. But until then, in this article we did see his entire signature squad. Starting with four copies 
copies of the Lurking Hormigons, a two-cost army unit with a single command icon, an attack value of three, and a single hit point. It has the creature and behemoth traits and reaction. After this unit is assigned damage, reassign up to two of that damage to your warlord instead. So, despite the printed, apparent frailty of this unit, that ability nevertheless allows you to cheat death, in that if the Hormagon happens to be taking a lethal attack, if you'd prefer to keep it on the tabletop, you can simply reassign that damage to your Warlord instead. And important to note is that your Warlord need not be present at that location. So, as long as you can manage to keep your Warlord exhausting and then readying, you'll potentially be able to heal away the damage that these lurking hormigons would otherwise incur, whether or not Old One-Eye's actually participating in that battle, or whether he's doing any fighting at all. The Hormagons as a whole are essentially kind of the frontline fodder foot soldiers of the Tyranid race. They're really the only species that lays eggs and reproduces themselves independent of the greater hive. So for that reason, I definitely see it making a hell of a lot of sense that they're seen as essentially expendable, but if you want to keep them around all the same, you definitely have the option to do so. And if it just so happens that they'd be soaking up some enormous attack, you don't want to reassign that damage because you might bloody your warlord or you're simply afraid of your opponent bloodying your warlord. That reaction is entirely optional, and I think having flexibility and options is always fantastic. At the same time, on the subject of versatility, it's for a cost of two, got a built-in command icon, so it can net you additional cards and resources, which is always going to be welcome, and it can help to supplement the command icon heavy toxic venom thrope we've already seen in hoping to amass the tyranid controller as many cards and resources as tyrannically possible. Still, probably the most obvious aspect of this card that I've still yet to touch on is that pretty enormous attack value of 3 for a 2 cost unit, so that can definitely dish out a tremendous amount of damage for a relatively inexpensive unit. So. Overall, I like the Lurking Hormigant quite a lot. I'm excited to see what else is going to come out with it, but it certainly does a fantastic job of synergizing with its dedicated warlord. I just think it's going to be of the utmost importance that if Old One-Eye doesn't end up involved in a combat, if those Hormigants are instead maybe fighting alongside your Savage Warrior Prime, that you ultimately try to find some way to exhaust Old One-Eye, just so you can try to make the most out of his ability as possible. So, definitely, if you opt to abuse and misuse this reaction, it could result in your warlord being fairly quickly bloodied or killed, but used wisely, used sparingly, and achieving some sort of balance between allowing your Hormigons to die, allowing Old One-Eye to take damage, and of course using various shield cards, I think that these all function very well together to create potentially what could amount to a devastatingly synergistic effect. I think, in particular, one of the most appealing aspects about this lurking Hormigant is I can easily see them forcing your opponent to overcommit attack value and ultimately launch inefficient attacks just to effectively guarantee that these Hormigants are killed. And if they're directing some of that fire away from some of your more valuable units, then this signature army unit could ultimately prove to be absolutely fantastic. But in any case, next up, our article spoils Old One-Eye's signature event. He has two copies of the one-cost event, Ferocious Strength. It has a single shield icon, the power trait, and the text action. Your warlord, or a synapse unit you control, gains brutal until the end of the combat round. 
So, for a very small cost of a single resource token, this nevertheless has the potential of being absolutely fantastic, in that you can accrue as much damage onto old one-eye as possible, maybe your opponent's been really pushing for that bloodying or even kill, and then you can punish them by suddenly leveraging all of those damage tokens in your favor. If it just so happens that you've got 5 damage on old one-eye, all of a sudden he's going to swing for an enormous 7. And then afterward, again, we have no idea what his bloodied side says, but at least so long as he's hail, once he launches that attack, you get to remove 3 of those tokens. And then that suddenly puts him back at a reasonably survivable 3 hit points. And considering that all the while you can always pick and choose when to deploy shield cards, you can allow old one eye to get a small amount of damage whatever it is that you happen to be comfortable with just because you can fully expect that not only is he going to be healing a lot of that away but from time to time you might be able to absolutely devastate your opponent with an effect like this one and all the same the one synapse unit we've had spoiled has a reservoir of five hit points and if they've already taken four damage if they're on the brink of death we have no idea if the Tyranid race or faction has access to any other kind of healing, but at the very least, whether or not you're ultimately going to lose that unit, you can really crank up the punishment on your opponent by surprisingly dropping this event onto the table and then suddenly swinging with that Savage Warrior Prime for up to six, discounting any number of attachments that any of these units may additionally have. And as we're about to cover, Old One-Eye gets one hell of an attachment in the Great Scything Talons. It's only a single copy in his signature squad, but it costs a single resource token, it has three shield icons, and it has the war gear and symbiote traits. It reads, Attach to your warlord. Attached unit gets plus one hit point and reaction. After damage is removed from attached unit, it gets plus X attack from its next attack this phase. X is the amount of damage removed. So, if you liked Ferocious Strength giving Brutal to Old One-Eye, boosting up his attack power from anywhere between 1 to 5, Great Scything Talons is similar in that it costs the exact same, but whereas that event is ephemeral, lasting until the end of one combat round, which under normal circumstances is one attack, but as we'll cover later in this video, those rules don't always apply. This attachment instead allows you to grant your warlord a permanent ability, in that each and every time he's healed, although the warlord card itself does specify that that's limited to once per round, it nevertheless gets plus X attack for its next attack, with X being however many damage tokens that you happen to remove. And again, considering that we're always rounding up, that can amount, entirely dependent on how early in a given game you ultimately draw and deploy this attachment, in several different rounds in which Old One-Eye is potentially dealing out absolutely devastating attacks. So, in the worst of cases, he's not healing, and he's not benefiting from this attachment whatsoever, but as soon as he heals even a single point of damage, you're increasing his attack power to a dangerous 3, 4, or 5, depending on just how high you and your opponent are allowing that damage token pile to climb. And plus, it's definitely worth considering that as this attachment boosts his base hit points up to 7, it makes it all the more likely that you're ultimately going to be healing 3 damage per turn, which not only has the benefit of depriving you of more damage tokens, but also serves to increase his attack by ever so slightly more on average than if this attachment did not have that additional bonus. 
Plus, it definitely goes without saying that a pool of 7 hit points is easier to keep alive than 6 or fewer, and considering that you've got the opportunity to play shield cards at any time under usual circumstances, and that this card in and of itself is a 3 shield value attachment, the ability for this card to keep your Warlord alive and regenerating to the utmost of his ability could potentially be absolutely spectacular for you and enormously frustrating for your opponent. For that reason, it's quite likely that your opponent's going to try and avoid damaging Old One-Eye as much as possible, but if it just happens to be him and lurking Hormigaunts, you can effectively force them to damage your Warlord, and considering that units don't get the option whether or not to attack each round, it's entirely possible that you can essentially corner your opponent force them into attacking your warlord, and then you let that damage through, unprevented, only for it to eventually be healed, and then for you to swing back, and, so long as your opponent doesn't get the chance to retreat, absolutely obliterate whatever's sitting across from you on the tabletop. And plus, it's entirely possible that if you've got your Warlord participating in some long, drug-out, knockdown brawl, most decisive, pivotal battle of the game, if you can somehow manage to stack the reaction of this attachment with that ferocious strength event, the amount of damage that your Warlord can deal out in a single blow is absolutely absurd, in that so long as your opponent puts as much damage onto your Warlord as possible, which, of course, you can always try to manipulate their math in your favor by leveraging as many or as few shield cards as you need to to continually adjust the amount of incoming damage, but under the most extreme of circumstances, it's entirely possible for Old One-Eye, if he's taking an enormous amount of punishment, to heal for three, ultimately get pushed to a pile of six damage tokens, and if you're able to trigger this reaction and ferocious strength, he can swing for an incredible and devastating total of 11 against any single enemy target. And, although it's oh so important to consider that the Great Scything Talons only functions to boost one attack, if you're nevertheless playing that Ferocious Strength, there's scarcely any better card to synergize that with than Old One-Eye's signature support. In the three-cost Awakening Cavern, with the location trait and action, exhaust this support to ready a target unit you control. So, seeing as how that Ferocious Strength event confers Brutal until the end of the combat round, so long as you can ready your Warlord once via the Awakening Cavern, he could ultimately benefit twice from that keyword at the least. And again, we have absolutely no idea what other Tyranid cards have yet to be unveiled, and seeing as how the Tyranid faction, for all we know, is entirely welcome to include neutral cards in their deck, there are any number of other effects that may come out sooner or later, or at some point during this game's development, that crank this already impressive amount of synergy up to an absolute 11. But in any case, if your Warlord is loaded up with damage, whether or not he's got those great scything talons, he could potentially deal out a pair of devastating attacks each round, up to a maximum value of 8 if he's got that increased pool of hit points and you're riding his damage tokens as dangerously as possible, or you could simply choose to use this, albeit rather expensive, support to ready any single unit you control. It could be a Termagant token, it could be your Warlord, it could be one of your elite army units, like the Striking Ravener we've seen previously released. It could also be the expensive army unit that I'm saving for the very end of this video, or it could be your Synapse unit, whether it's the Savage Warrior Prime or any of the others that we've yet to see. 
If it just so happens that your opponent triggers some sort of nasty effect to exhaust any of your Tyranids, it's entirely possible that you can use this support to correct that play of theirs, and then you can leverage any number of nasty events or effects or abilities that you were otherwise fully intending to employ, once again, with nothing to stop you. So, taken all together, I think this makes for a rather powerful signature squad. I'll be sure to cover this in much greater depth and detail in a later video specifically dedicated to Old One-Eye and his signature squad, but the article certainly does not stop there. In next, it moves on to reminding us about the infestation mechanic and how that confers the Tyranid player specific benefits on a card-by-card -card basis, so long as they either happen to be deployed at a planet where you possess an infestation token, or if you're choosing to deploy them to an infested planet, or any number of different things along those lines. We know that opponents can remove infestation tokens by winning battles at planets where there happens to be an infestation token, and we've seen one way for the Tyranid player to put those tokens into play, in the form of the one-cost army unit Virulent Spore Sacks, which, during combat, sacrifices itself to not just deal damage, but also put an infestation token into play. And we've seen effects like the Hunter Gargoyles, which are a very cheap, rather hard-hitting, albeit frail unit that can nevertheless use an action to move to an infested planet. So despite their seeming frailty, so long as you're able to get some of these infestation tokens into play, you can nevertheless shift them about the battlefield in an opportunistic sense to nevertheless deal out a considerable amount of damage to your opponent. And in this article, we're introduced to two new cards, two new ways to put infestation tokens into play. The first of these is yet another Tyranid army unit in the two-cost Scything Hormigons, with a single command icon, an attack value of two, two hit points, the creature and Leviathan high fleet traits, as well as reaction. After you deploy this unit, infest this planet. So... Quite simply, it's hard to go wrong with a unit like this one, it's hard to find much to sing praises about, and it's difficult to point out many weaknesses for your opponent to exploit or for you to be aware of. A single command icon could potentially allow it to help you win resources and cards, it's hitting respectably hard, it's not absolutely trivial for your opponent to dispatch with anything along the lines of Sicarius's Chosen or Weird Boy Maniac or any number of other effects, and probably most important about this card is that it allows you a very simple means of getting infestation tokens into play during the deployment phase or indeed any time that you happen to specifically deploy this unit. So not just put it into play, but specifically deploy. It doesn't cost much, and really the problem with assessing this card and so many others is that the value of putting one of these tokens into play hinges entirely upon how many cards we see. So I mentioned the Gargoyles earlier, but another card we've seen is a two-cost event, Spore Burst, which during the deployment phase allows you to recur up to three-cost dead Tyranid army units back into play at any infested planet you'd like. So... Certainly we'll see more and more cards over time that make infesting planets all the more worthwhile. In fact, we're going to be covering one a little later on in this video. But before we move on to that, the second of our trio of new ways of putting infestation tokens into play is the zero-cost event predation. It has a single shield icon and the tactic trait, and it reads quite simply, action. Infest a planet adjacent to an infested planet. 
So, as long as you happen to already have one of those infestation tokens anywhere on the field of battle, on any given planet, this allows you to spread a new infestation token to an adjacent planet. So, whether you simply want more targets for things like your hunter gargoyles to travel to, whether you simply want more planets where you can trigger spore burst, or whether you're maybe in danger of losing the first planet because it's about to be added to either player's victory display, this nevertheless allows you a fantastic opportunity of, for a cost of zero, spreading infestation. And plus, if you need not take advantage of this effect, having even a single shield icon means that it's yet another way for you to try to keep your warlord and any number of other Tyranid army units alive for as long as possible. I had the opportunity to spoil an additional card earlier, but opted not to do so, seeing as how it was, and still is, part of a partially spoiled, partially revealed fan of cards that we see again in this article, but we've also seen a Tyranid one-cost support in the Digestion Pool, which, unless I'm gravely mistaken, I feel is rather safe to assume that it effectively reads that when you happen to to deploy a Tyranid to a planet that happens to be infested, you can essentially exhaust that support in order to reduce the resource cost required to play that unit by two. So it's unique, it's limited, it has all the same ups and downs of so many other faction-specific resource reduction supports we've seen in the core set, but it has that added element of ever so slightly higher risk and reward, in that if you're unable to manage to keep infested planets on the tabletop, or simply the planets where you aren't interested in deploying Tyranids happen to be infested, that could be of potentially enormous benefit, and it could potentially set you back at least a card and a resource. So, yet again, it remains to be seen just how effective any of these individual cards are alone, let alone taken all together, but I'm definitely excited to see just how potentially powerful the Tyranids as a faction may ultimately be. All the same, our third and final means of infesting planets, and second to last, penultimate spoiler of this article, is the Noxious Flesh Borer, a one-cost attachment with a shield icon. It has the war gear and symbiote traits, and it reads, Attached to an Army Unit. Attached unit gets plus one attack and plus one hit point while it is at an infested planet. And reaction. After you win a command struggle at this planet, infest it. So, yet another means of putting infestation tokens into play. It's entirely possible that if this is affixed to an army unit traveling alongside your warlord, and you're winning multiple command struggles, you can use this to repeatedly infest multiple planets throughout the battlefield, as opposed to simply sticking this onto one unit and then having them sit there for the rest of the game. Or, it's entirely possible you might affix this to one of your hunter gargoyles that can move between infested planets. But, even if you aren't intending to use this specifically for its infestation effect, it nevertheless does confer a significant attack and HP boost to the attached unit. So, one attack value may not seem like much, but it nevertheless can make a considerable difference. Taking our Lurking Hormigon, for instance, it has a printed attack value of 3. And, given that we've seen a grand total of 142 different army units throughout the core set and warlord cycle of war packs, a grand total of 92 of those have 3 or fewer hit points. 
But as soon as you boost that attack value up to 4, you're killing 115 out of that 142, up from 92. So instead of settling for killing 65% in a single swing, all of a sudden, unless your opponent's playing shield cards or using any number of different effects to their advantage, you're able to kill an entire 81% of units in the game with something like a 2 cost army unit with a one cost attachment so whether or not it's worth it to you for that situational attack bonus so long as the units at an infested planets as with any of these cards and as with many effects it ultimately remains to be seen but definitely something to consider and in any case this confers another small hit point boost so it makes those hormigons all the more survivable it makes that reaction all the more optional in that ever so often you may allow them to sponge up one point of damage or you can simply opt to affix this to any number of powerful, potent, formidable Tyranid units to make them all the more hardy and all the more deadly and dangerous than they already are. For instance, of the pair of Tyranid Elite units we've seen spoiled thus far, both of them are entirely eligible to have a fixed war gear. And the Striking Ravener, a 3 attack, 5 hit point, 5 cost army unit, has the reaction after this unit destroys an army unit by an attack, ready this unit. So if you can manage to destroy even a single enemy unit with that same printed attack value as that lurking Hormigant, if you're suddenly able to keep continually swinging for four, the number of enemy units that you can potentially destroy is absolutely absurd. And even keeping in mind that it has to be army units that you're destroying, if it just so happens that your opponent happens to have a token sitting at that planet, that might as well be your last and final target, so that you can trigger that readying effect as much as possible, and then ultimately exhaust, finish off that token, and then let your striking ravener lie. Still, if the Striking Ravener is not your cup of tea, the final spoiler we've had revealed in this article is one hell of an army unit. It's the six-cost Shrieking Harpy, with two command icons, two attack value, five hit points, the creature, kraken, and elite traits, and the flying keyword, as well as combat reaction. After this unit is declared as an attacker at an infested planet, exhaust each enemy, non-elite army unit, and token unit at this planet, which... I would imagine goes without saying, has the potential to be utterly devastating to your opponent. Not only is this unit exceptionally durable with a pool of 5 hit points, making it all but unkillable via the likes of Zinch's Firestorm or Warp Storm or any number of small incremental sources of damage, but it's also got that flying keyword, which in an attack type context, often treats it as effectively having a printed pool of 10 hit points. Although, similar to Old One-Eye, any kind of having effect is always going to be rounded up. Certainly the Shrieking Harpy's greatest weakness is its rather low attack value, but if it just so happens that you want to increase that amount, you're certainly welcome to affix something the likes of our Noxious Flesh Borer, which gives it 3, 4, or 5, depending on how many copies of that attachment you're wanting to affix. And, if it just so happens that you recall from our last Tyranid preview, if you're ever interested in really cranking the Shrieking Harpy's attack value into high gear, but don't mind a significant investment of resources, the Heavy Venom Cannon is yet another attachment option, in that it not only confers a plus two attack bonus, but it also gives the attached unit the option, as a combat action, of gaining either Area Effect 2 or Armor Bane until the end of the phase. 
and even though area effect does not count as an attack, it counts as a card effect, Armor Bane most definitely does. So at that point, if you're attacking for four or more, Armor Bane, all of a sudden that printed to attack value isn't looking too bad at all. Certainly you want to avoid putting too many eggs in one basket, and this unit's already expensive, clocking in at six resources, but it's nevertheless possible it might be gaining you some cards and resources, probably because your opponent is likely to want to avoid any kind of committance or deployment to a planet where you happen to have a harpy. So, granted that combat reaction does necessitate that its location be infested, but therefore it makes it all the more beneficial, if not necessary, for you to devise some sort of clever means, whether it's something so simple as a noxious flesh borer to infest that planet, or whether you're simply using predation, or the virulent spore sacs, whatever it happens to be, it's of the utmost importance that you manage to infest its planet, just because once you do manage to have it sitting at an infested planet, it's rather unlikely that your opponent is going to be able to contest you. It definitely falls prey to the same pitfalls that so many elite units do, things along the lines of Clavex War Leader destroying this during an ambush, or your opponent triggering an Archon's Terror, or getting in a first attack with a Blackheart Ravager. Any source of routing is a fantastic answer to the Harpy, but under optimal or even sub-optimal conditions, as soon as this unit is declared an attacker, it does not matter if your opponent entirely negates its printed or boosted attack value. As soon as it's declared, you exhaust each enemy army unit and token at that planet. It can affect any number of units with absolutely no ceiling, and so long as they're not elites, which generally don't see a lot of play on the tabletop in the first place, they're going to be entirely unable to do anything against you for the remainder of the round unless your opponent has some means of readying them, which in many factions is either entirely unpresent or in the best of cases, often nearly unheard of. This bears a striking resemblance to the Eldar Mighty Wraith Knight, which in and of itself is a 5-5 body, so it serves to certainly hit a hell of a lot harder, but it is nevertheless not a flying unit. And it happens to have the effect where, upon entering play, it exhausts each non-spirit trait unit at its planet. But that ability is strikingly different in that it has the potential of exhausting that player's own units, and considering just how scarcely few spirit units even an Eldar player has, it's quite likely to do a fair bit of harm in addition to any good, outside of some sort of Gift of Isha type context. Plus, that unit definitely has the ability of potentially winning that player command struggles as well, whereas the Harpy, having to wait until the combat phase, doesn't quite have that same opportunity. But nevertheless, this is an effect that can occur time and time again, and force your opponent to either retreat, which is often entirely undesirable, seeing as how it often all but guarantees they're going to lose that battle, but really, your opponent's only other option is to sit there, turn after turn, being exhausted, letting his or her forces get whittled away by the Shrieking Harpy itself, and whatever other units you happen to have present. Even though the opponent's Warlord is free to attack you, and the opponent's other Synapse units, if they happen to be playing Tyranids, are also remaining unexhausted if this effect gets triggered, I really doubt that most opponents are going to want their warlord sitting at a planet where you've got a shrieking harpy supplemented by any number of other effects. Just because even in a one-on-one -on -one context, given that you'll have approximately the same number of shield cards as your opponent does, 
unless they really want to get involved in some drug out war of attrition, it's probably not going to go very well for them being deeply invested in a combat at that planet. And once you get an attack off, if you do manage to start exhausting your enemy's units, I think things are going to go downhill for them extraordinarily quickly. And if they have to retreat with a large number of units, and during the next round they all have to commit alongside their warlord, showing up exhausted, that not only allows you the potential to win all the more command struggles, netting a ton of cards and resources, but also serves to potentially give you an enormous advantage in any number of combats the following round. Just because exhausted units are exceptionally easy to destroy, and at the very least, they help to keep some of even your most frail and fragile Tyranid attackers entirely alive and able to dish out copious amounts of punishment before you need worry about any incoming fire in return, even if your harpies entirely uninvolved Involved in any subsequent combats. So, definitely spectacular, likely a presence that you'd love to see during a decisive battle at the first or any other planets, very much a steep investment. Whether or not it's ultimately worth it remains to be seen. Granted, its statistical distribution is absolutely nothing compared to something like an Ultramarine's Dreadnought, but again, even in that kind of situation up against some hellish and daunting opponent, if you're the player with initiative, your opponent essentially has to retreat or lose every unit they have on the battlefield, unless they have some sort of clever effect. And plus, even if your opponent does destroy this unit, it's an elite, so not only is it immune to deception, but you could simply fall back this unit back into play at your HQ. So, it's an incredible unit. I'm not going to say it's not vulnerable to the likes of Doom or Exterminatus or any number of other effects, but what unit in this game is invulnerable? I suppose with the exception of Old One-Eye, but that in and of itself also remains to be seen. But that brings us to an end of this article. We've covered nine new spoilers today. So as always, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already. Please let me know in the comments section what your own thoughts, opinions, and speculations upon these and any other Tyranid cards happens to be. I always love engagement and input with and from you guys. So yet again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you again soon.